Hello, everybody. Today, we are joined by Hannah Marmora, who is currently a PhD student at Western University studying ACL injuries. Hannah is also a research assistant at the Fowler Kennedy Sports Medicine Clinic, investigating ACL tears in young patients, as well as a ton of incredible knowledge on bones and joints. Hannah, how are you doing today? I'm good. Thank you for having me. No worries. We are very, very excited to chat with you today about all things ACL. So I guess we'll start nice and easy. What are ACL injuries and how do they occur? Awesome. Yeah. So for anyone that doesn't know that ACL is our acronym for the anterior cruciate ligament in your knee. So that ligament runs from your thigh, mu- your thigh bone, your femur down to your tibia, and it kind of comes anterior medially. So towards the front and towards the middle. And the main purpose of this ligament, it's the primary stabilizer of your knee. So it keeps your knee stable. It stops the tibia or like the shin bone from coming forwards and from rotating internally. So that's why it's important. So basically an ACL injury is when that ligament is torn. Um, Usually it's a complete tear, but it can be partially torn as well. And other than... um, that stability piece, the ACL is also important for some proprioception. So knowing where you are in space and kind of where your knee joint is in space. So that can also be disrupted. Um, Excuse me. Normally ACL injuries occur from a non-contact mechanism. So like 70 to 90% of ACL injuries are not from a collision of players. It's usually just someone doing a quick movement, usually like a cut or a pivot sometimes landing from a jump weird or slowing down really quickly. Um, And then other scenarios, so the other 30 to 10% can be from a contact mechanism. So someone getting hit by another player, usually when you're hit from the outside of your knee, and then it causes that inwards motion. So that's a little bit about the ACL and how those injuries occur. So even though they're non-contact injuries, they can leave a player or an athlete out for some time. Is that why injury or such an ACL injury is deemed as dangerous as they are? Yeah. So because there's a few other ligaments in our knee, we have the MCL, the LCL, the PCL. So there are some other structures in there, but that ACL is the main stabilizer of your knee. So when that's torn, it causes a lot of instability if it's not corrected, your knee can give way a lot. It can cause a lot of pain and symptoms. And then the big thing for athletes is that it can have an impact on performance or ability to play your sport or at least play your sport to the level maybe that you're hoping or without kind of that fear of giving way. Um, Most young athletes will have their ACL reconstructed when it's torn. Um, because that does give you the stability back and able to return to come some of those more high risk activities. But that surgery comes with a really long recovery process. It takes up to a year to get back to sport. Um, It involves a really um, intensive rehab program. There's definitely some pain involved, getting back to doing simple activities. And then there's also that piece of like economic impact on the healthcare system and time off work, time off school, time off sport, all those things that we know also decrease people's quality of life, which is a really big thing that I look at in my research of like how these injuries impact kind of everything in someone's life. Um, And lastly, we know that any trauma to the knee, so like an ACL injury is a trauma to the knee, that also increases the risk of developing osteoarthritis in the future. So that's something much more long-term, like 10, 15, 20 years post-injury, but we do have that increased risk of developing osteoarthritis, which can impact mobility and have um, some symptoms or pain associated. But those are a few reasons why people are concerned about these injuries and why they can be pretty devastating, especially to athletes that are trying to live that active lifestyle and do some of those motions that are risky for that kind of injury. So it's not just short-term impacts you also have long-term impacts like you mentioned and if you can touch on just players who are able to rehab and then come back onto the sport it's often they do have a long period when they're able to regain their form come back on is that Mm -hmm. another impact because of just the overall mobility and the fact that the knee hasn't been able to operate is it usually would yeah totally so after an injury whether you have the surgery or not um usually you'll have to take a period of rest which in that 
period of time, muscles usually get weaker because they're not being used. So rebuilding that strength back is really important. And as most people know that have tried to gain that strength, it takes a while. And returning back to sport without the adequate strength can increase your risk of having another injury. So in active young people, the risk of re-tearing your ACL even after you have the ACL reconstruction is anywhere from 5 to 20 percent. Um, the biggest risk factor for having a second ACL tear is having the first one. So as soon as you have that first initial ACL rupture, you're going to be at an increased risk for having a second one just because of usually the strength is different, your body's a little bit different. And the other biggest risk factor for ACL injury is sport. So high risk, like cutting, pivoting, contact sports. So returning to that just increases your risk as well. And sometimes people do re-tear the surgery side, but you can also have an increased risk of now re-tearing the other knee or sorry, tearing the other knee. So your contralateral side. So um, you're able to rehab, but the longer that you wait to return back to sport, the better. So research shows Uh, For every month that an athlete waits to return to their sport, it significantly decreases their risk of re-injury. So what's recommended is 9 to 12 months. So people really shouldn't be getting back until 9 months to ideally a year back to their Mm -hmm. sport, which for a lot of people can be really devastating. And especially um, at certain ages when you have one year left or you're trying to make a team or get a scholarship, like all those really important key moments in a sporting career, a year can make a big difference. So that can have an impact. Yeah, no, that certainly looks like, and and you see those impacts on those players, specifically those maybe towards slightly the end of their career, they're pretty mm-hmm. concerned, often calling it a career ending injury because it could be yeah. that bad. So what would you say the current research tells us about ACL injuries and their relation to female athletes? Yeah, so there's a lot of interesting research looking at um, female versus male athletes. And just as a like disclaimer, I guess, most of the differences that I'm talking about here are like related to biological sex. So not necessarily gender identity, but the actual biological differences in anatomy and hormones and all those things. So research shows that when you control for sport, because like I said, sport is going to be your number one risk factor. Those contact sports, pivoting sports, cutting sports, that's going to be the biggest risk factor for having these injuries because of how they occur. So that's your things like soccer, American football, basketball, um, and skiing are kind of our main sports that we see a lot of ACL injuries. But beyond that, when you control for the type of sport, females are shown to have two to 10 times higher risk of having an ACL injury compared to males in the same sport. So there's a few reasons why that could be. Um, It seems a lot to do with kind of how females versus males mature through puberty. We don't really see these differences pre-puberty. Males undergo what we call like a neuromuscular spurt. So they have increased ligament stiffness, and then they also increase their muscle strength and power. So all three of those things are protective against ACL injuries. So that kind of is helping them out. Versus females don't undergo the exact same changes. We have a higher risk of having generalized ligamentous laxity. So that just means all the ligaments in your body are a little bit more lax, a little bit more, have a little bit more give in them. Um, And that is a separate risk factor for ACL injury. And we don't get quite the same increase in muscular strength and power that males do. So then there's things like quad dominant. So basically that means your quads are a lot stronger than your hamstrings. That's a risk factor for ACL injuries. Having poor trunk control, poor hip control, things like that, that females seem to be more predisposed to just based on anatomy and how we mature that Mm -hmm. puts females at a higher risk of injury. And that's not to say that those things can't be controlled for or trained for. There's a lot of things you can do to mitigate that risk, but just on a baseline level, that's kind of why we see those differences. Yeah. No, like you mentioned, the female anatomy is obviously one of the biggest reasons it has surfaced to be almost the only reason. Would you say maybe there are certain literature that kind of focuses at 
the fact that there's maybe not enough access to training facilities, medical staff at clubs who specifically focus on knee rehab or ACLs, or if you are to bring an example specifically from football or soccer, there's almost a lack of football boot design that are designed just for female athletes. Does that kind of act like a domino effect on top of everything else that are together in the same kind of key factors? Totally. It's kind of sometimes it's hard to separate out what is the biology and the anatomy and what is more that what I'd call like socio environmental context. We do see that female athletes are kind of treated differently at the different stages of their career. So young athletes and training and competition, all those different aspects, there might be different training facilities, like you said, different attention to like strength programs, often male teams have a lot more attention directed towards separate strength training, which can be one of the biggest helpful protective factors for ACL injuries than maybe females do. Mm -hmm. Different levels of coaching or like physical therapists, healthcare professionals involved with the team, funding, all that kind of stuff that can kind of lead to some of these differences not being addressed or some of the prevention things and programs not being implemented in a way that can be helpful. In terms of shoes, I don't know a ton about football boots specifically, but I do know that like playing surface and shoes also do have an impact on the risk of ACL injury. So basically higher shoe to surface friction is going to increase the risk of ACL injury. It's not one of the main risk factors. It's not going to have as much of an influence as the type of sport or age or some of those other factors. But there is some research showing that like having more cleats or longer cleats is going to increase the risk of ACL injury because of the increased friction. And also we seem to see more injuries on grass versus artificial surfaces. So Mm -hmm. if the male teams are getting the artificial surfaces to practice and play on and the female teams are outside or the different shoes are different between the two that could definitely have an impact. So it's obviously there's somewhat of a clear gap between investment and funding when it comes to female sports. It's not just giving the facilities, but it's also making sure that that research actually is just towards the female athletes because, you know, again, looking at certain literature, sports, their research behind sports kind of are shaped and are aimed to serve men athletes and there's Mm. not that kind of attention when it comes to female athletes and so what are the certain methods that are used either implemented or yet to be so that work to decrease ACL injuries in the women's game or that specifically work to kind of mediate such disadvantages? Totally yeah and you are totally right that most scientific research in any subject is very biased towards having male participants and focusing on the male body. And then it's hard to know whether some of the conclusions from that research are going to apply to females, because like we said, there are clear differences. So that's a really good thing to look out for if you're ever reading research about these topics is, are there females involved? What's the split between male and females? And will this apply? One of the really great things that I like to say about ACL research is, since we've identified this gap or this increased risk of ACL injuries in female players, there has been a lot of research to look at how we can prevent this. So often in research, there are very few things that we can say there's strong evidence to support. But one of the things that we can say that for is prevention programs for ACL injuries. So neuromuscular training programs, prevention programs has very, very strong evidence to support it. There was a meta-analysis done in 2018. So that just means taking all the studies done on the topic, putting them together, and then looking at the combined effect of that. And that showed that prevention programs can decrease the risk of ACL injury by 50% for ACL injuries across the across the board, and then 66% for non-contact injuries in females specifically. So a great thing about this literature is that most of the prevention program research looks at female athletes specifically. So a lot of these studies only included females because of that identified risk. So that's really great. Um, Mm -hmm. The programs usually include like strength, flexibility, plyometrics, running, balance, and then some education pieces. But it's all things that can be put into like a normal sports warm up. So the programs Mm -hmm. only take about 20 minutes. Usually they recommend athletes or teams start this in preseason about six weeks out from 
the season and then mm-hmm. maintain it throughout. And it can be included as part of the team's regular warm up. And it's also been shown to help boost sport performance. So that's an extra bonus. There's a lot of different ones out there. I know mm-hmm. specific to football, there's a FIFA prevention program. It's called FIFA 11 plus. Mm-hmm. I can send you information about that if you're interested. And yeah. It's been shown to reduce injury rates by 45% and decrease time lost to injury by 30%, specifically in competitive soccer players. So it's a really great one. And like I said, this is one of the re- the areas of research that we actually have strong evidence for, which is awesome. So the biggest thing you can do is training. And that is important because of all the reasons that I said why females are at an increased risk for the injury. So mm-hmm. maybe weaker hamstrings, poor hip control, Um, females often are predisposed to what we call dynamic valgus so that means when the knee comes inward when you're like landing or squatting or anything and that's usually due to weaknesses in the glutes hips thighs hamstrings Mm -hmm. so doing these training programs can basically overcome all of those like biological through puberty differences that we see that predispose athletes, female athletes specifically to those like mechanisms of injury mm-hmm. that we see because of poor body control, these training programs can help somewhat overcome that, which is really exciting and promising and it's yeah. not too hard to implement. So I think that's something teams and athletic trainers, physiotherapists, whoever's working with the teams, coaches should invest in and it's nothing too, too complicated. Um I mean, you pretty much said it. Research yeah. is there. You just need the investment to use those 100%. research methods onto the fields and onto the players and around in the environment of any athletes, whether it's football, basketball, running, skiing, any kind of, like you mentioned, non-contact sport. Hannah, just one more thing. Um, yeah. How can people read any of your work, your your published stuff? Because like you said, it's a researcher who's doing all the stuff, knows all the ins and outs. <laughs> how can people reach out to you? Yeah, yeah. Um, you can basically just look my name up on Google Scholar. ResearchGate is a great place to look at some of this research. Um, I'm active on Twitter. My uh, handle is my name, Hannah Marmura. Um, reach out anytime. I can send you my email address as well. I'm always happy to talk about all things ACL. I love the research that I'm doing. I think it's really important, especially for female athletes. It's one of those injuries that gets a lot of attention, and we know that it's it is higher risk for female athletes, but that doesn't mean that female athletes shouldn't be playing these sports. For that sure. doesn't mean that they are not designed for these movements or these sports. It just means that we need more attention and the investment, like you said, to do the things that we know that works to help protect them from these injuries as best as we can and get the right care afterwards to have the surgery, if that's what's decided, rehab properly and return them back with a proper protocol in a way that's going to be successful so yeah absolutely well i will most definitely be leaving multiple beneficial journals and resources published by hannah in fact by the resources how i found hannah <laughs> very great stuff um in the description where you can read and find and probably grow more knowledge than what we just discussed um and yeah all the links for hannah will be down in the bottom so thank you very much hannah for joining us today no problem thank you for having me again and yeah Anyone, please feel free to reach out with questions at any time. There you go. Awesome.